The following program contains content that may disturb some viewers. This is Mizbah and Shamim. They've both been recognised as refugees. Shamim, who's 17, has spent 1,090 days in Nauru. For Mizbah, who's 13 and has been in detention on Christmas Island and Nauru, it's been 1,179 days. When Shamim first heard she was being transferred to Nauru, she thought it was Norway. She was only 14. When they told us about you going to Nauru, and then I was like, oh, we're going to Norway, it's so good. Like, Norway is so beautiful. Mom, Granny, why are you crying? This is, we're going to Norway. But Nauru was a long way from Norway. I feel so bad that, oh, I was thinking that we're going to be in Norway, but I'm in Norway. Where is this place? I, I never heard in my life this place where is Norway. I feel so bad. And, I, and then I feel like they're going to eat me. I was so young and I was like, Mom, I'm so scared. I feel they will eat me. And my mom, she, she was crying. She said, don't be so... Scared, everything's gonna be fine. Like Shamim, Mizbah fled Myanmar. In Burma, there, the Muslim people and Buddhist people are fighting, and the Buddhist people doesn't want Muslim people to stay in Burma. That's why they they doesn't like us, so they kill they kill mostly the Muslim people, and they rape the girls. They kill the boys and they burn the houses. Ms. Bar left with her mother and three sisters. She was only nine. She says there wasn't enough money for her father to come with them. So he planned to follow later. On the boat, that was so dangerous. And you know, even my little sister, she was crying. She was like, oh, I'm so scared of this swimming pool. She was like, she thought that was a swimming pool. My mom was crying too. But when we get to Christmas Island, we were so happy that we are here, we are safe. And we, I was thinking that I would get to meet my father again. At first, to everyone who met her, Shamim seemed irrepressible. Oh, she was very talkative, you know, and she was always asking for more work, more work. She wanted to be, yeah, an obstetrician, she was very ambitious, very focused on the future and very, very, you know, happy, bubbly. At school in the detention centre, Shamim was a star student. She always sought out additional support and double checking and handing in drafts and making sure that she was on the right track. Um, <clears throat> so she had really high hopes for her future and, and, and dreams that, that she could easily have, have achieved, easily. Gabby Sutherland, Tracy Donahue and Jude Reen all spent nearly a year and a half teaching in the school run by Save the Children in the Nauru Detention Centre. Under Australian law, they could go to jail for talking about the children they taught there, but they've decided they have to. Well, it's death by slow torture. It's, yeah, it's just <clears throat> how to... <laughs> the, the place is set up to make people go mad or make people just make people die inside. You know what, because the, the harm is permanent. It's, the damage is done for these children, it is done. Three years of their lives has been, have been spent, sorry, in the camp. Sorry. The, 
I just want to make sure it doesn't happen to another generation. At first, despite the fences, the mouldy tents and the 45 degree heat, the teachers were amazed by their students. I, I really felt sorry for them in the conditions that they were living in. And then on the other hand, was so surprised at how resilient they were. You know, they, they'd always play little tricks or make funny comments in class. They were cheeky and vibrant. They were so bubbly and it was hard to contain their enthusiasm. To get there and find that they were very, um, very ambitious and driven and many of them, yeah, prioritised education that, um, yeah, I was really, as a teacher, certainly at the beginning, that made my job easier and more pleasant. The school, which had air conditioning, became a refuge from the detention camp. They needed to get out of the camp to come to school to get away from that stultifying you know, traumatic environment. The school was their reprieve, it was their safe place. It was the one happy place. It was the one safe, happy place in that whole environment. The teachers were kind, they were professional teachers. It got them out of the camp, they went in tents. You know, they were in a, you know, like in a modern environment, a comfortable environment, a secure environment, a nurturing environment. They were very polite to us and we were polite to them too. So, like, it was a fantastic school. It was amazing. We were having a very good time and we feel it was the, the safest place for us to stay in here. Outside the school, the children weren't called by their names, but were called by their boat numbers. They were being treated as criminals. They were going through metal, de like being detected, metal detected, wandered, um, you know, on and off the bus at both ends of the school trip. They know that we have nothing. Still, they are checking every time when we go out and when we come back, every time. So it's also a bad thing in detention centre. We live in detention centre and they do that every day, every single day. They never forget, even though they forget to do something, but they will never forget to make us feel bad. As the months passed, the teachers saw detention taking its toll on the children. You could see the light drain out of their eyes. You could see them go flat. You'd just see um, their morale completely drop and they'd be physically but not, you know, mentally present. And they'd say, teacher, I can't think, I can't concentrate. Um, and uh, eventually um, we put in an order for some bean bags for a reading corner. Sadly, you know, students would come in and I just remember one particular girl lying in the bean bag and just weeping for three hours. Shimin stopped asking for extra schoolwork. She started to get quieter, withdrawing from her peers. Uh, she became more withdrawn, um, contributing less in class, uh, not asking for extension, and when I would offer it to her, she would just say, no, I can't, I can't think. By mid-2014, the teachers were seeing worrying signs of depression. After they'd been there for like between eight and 12 months, that's when you started to see um, kids, you know, hiding their arms. They were beginning to self-harm. These were teenagers that that was the only thing they had control of was their own body. So they were turning in on themselves. They weren't being violent. They were being, you know, they felt like nothing. And I know students who would, you know, at times sort of say, you know, I, over that time that I was there, that 16 months, would say, I would never do that. No matter how bad this gets, I will never, never self-harm. And just about every student that has said that to me has self-harm, self-harmed during their time there. 
Then in September 2014, the Australian government put out a video message. My name is Scott Morrison and I'm the Australian Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. You may have heard that temporary protection visas are to be reintroduced. This policy does not apply to those who are on Nauru or on Manus Island or have been transferred there. This For those in Nauru, it meant apply. any hopes of making it to Australia were crushed. Processing and resettlement in Australia will never be an option for those who have been transferred to regional processing centres because they have arrived in Australia illegally by boat. People in Nauru saw it as punishment. In most of the news, they think they say that we are criminals and we are not uh, good persons to come in Australia. We feel very sad. Most of the people even think that they they'll suicide and that's better for them than having like this much stress. They just have a small brain and they just they think too much and it's going to explode. There were mass protests after that, so for the first time, you know, in the life of the school, children stopped coming, especially the older children. They put out their camp beds in the communal area in the camp and just lay out there in protest, not eating. Um, one of my 17-year-old uh, girl students, she sewed her lips together. Uh, there were two other students in the school who I knew well. They sewed their lips together. We went down to the camp a lot and tried to coax them back up to school. We went down and tried to talk them down from the protest. Um, you know, come on, you're coming to school. And, and that was just heartbreaking to see some of, you know, some of our students who had only, you know, a month, a month beforehand been, you know, bright, vivacious, chatty teenagers. You know, if you took them out of the context situation that we're in, you know, just like teenagers anywhere around the world, to see them, yeah, just to see them looking at you with vacant eyes. It was like constantly talking people off a ledge, you know, constantly trying to um, instill some hope, you know, and say, you're worth, you're worth it. You are important. There are people who need you, love you. You will do something good with your life. You will make a contribution in the future. You are someone. You matter, you know. Most of us had worked in statutory child protection for at least over four years before we came to Nauru. Um, so um, it was very frustrating for myself and, and I think for, for all that we could not do and make real recommendations even though we were highly trained. Child protection workers like Alyssa Munoz felt powerless. We were really there to get people through day by day, um, to get them through to the next day. I have one little girl, which I'll never forget, who I think had just had enough, and there was a chair um, right on the balcony, and she stood on the balcony, and I came over and I said, what are you doing? And she said, if I jumped right now, no, it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't, who cares? And so for 10 minutes, I spoke to her about how much I would care if she did and how much her father would care if, if she did jump. So for that time, I held my hand over in front of her, over the side of the balcony, and what was going through my head, if she jumps, can I grab that back of her? Will I be able to grab her in time? Yeah, I'll never forget that, that moment. It was, so for about 10 minutes, I'm trying to talk this beautiful, she was only nine, 10 at the time, to st not to jump off the balcony of the school. I mean, that's how traumatised these children are. That was Batol? That was Batol. What sort of kid was she? <sighs> the most vivacious, spirited young little girl I've ever met. This is Batol. Two years later, she's still in Nauru with her father and sister. She's 10. I think about her all the time. I mean, especially that I still have um, 
nightmares of that particular moment and I, I still I sometimes see her actually jumping. Once Save the Children was in Nauru, we every time we go to school, we didn't miss a day and we loved that school. We had so much fun with them. She has amazing ambitions and amazing spirit and I really think that um, she's destined for great things later as she gets older because she really understands and gets the world itself um, and has great empathy for others as well. But Hall and her father and sister are Iranian. They've been officially recognised as refugees. Batol has now spent 976 days in Nauru, nearly a third of her lifetime. She's so smart. That's why I'd always say, you could run this camp, Batol. So I worry about the loss of education, huge gaps in education, because that's why I say she's so smart, but um, I worry that she won't get the um, opportunities that will, yeah, let her reach her full potential. In Nauru, Gabby Sutherland taught design and technology. She ran cooking classes and pancake days and brought in wood and tools to make boxes. But her most popular project was getting the children to turn the classroom into a cafe. It was supposed to be a one-off. They had a vote, they, they had all of these different, different names and had a vote on the, on the name and called the, the cafe, or this, the one-off cafe, the Red Rose Cafe. The Red Rose Cafe became a regular event run by the children. They were just so happy. It was just lovely to see the kids, uh, just happy, normal children in a normal environment which wasn't really a normal environment outside the door. It was amazing. I feel like, I feel like that I was having a real cafe. We make cakes, we make coffees, and I walk as a waiter in there. The Save the Children provide everything. They make us happy, they bring us hope. Even though they can't do anything, they're just trying to cope with us. And then last time they made a First, like cafe, which called Red Rose, and it was so good. And my friend, she was a manager in there, and it was just extremely feel good. But in March 2015, the children were told there'd be no more Red Rose Cafe. As people were given refugee status and moved out of the camp, the Australian school was going to be closed. The children were told they'd have to go to schools in the Nauruan community. They were devastated. We asked them not to close, like, like we nearly to beg them, but they didn't listen to us. They said, this is the order, you all have to go to, like, Nauruan school. At around that time, Shamim started to get physically unwell. She was pale, she said she couldn't eat, um, yeah, having headaches, she had a lump in her chest, she was feeling numb down one side of her body. And then she, I remember that kind of came to a head, she passed out in camp, so she fainted down in camp. She was just talking about suicide, talking about self-harm, talking about how how hopeless the situation was and uh, I can re I can remember s sitting down with her and she was just she was just uh, just this sadness just sadness and hopelessness in in her in a voice in a face in her, her her body it was just it was she it was like she'd given up and when a child expresses that they want to kill themselves in that environment, you believe them. At least seven incident reports around that time document Shamim talking about self-harm and suicide. I wasn't feeling okay and it was so, so bad and 
I want to feel the pain which I'm having in my like heart and it's so bad. So I'm just taking it out like to have it. But still when I did it, did it, I didn't have any, it wasn't painful. But I still did it. I wasn't okay and I just did some stupid things. Maybe just for a while I forget the feeling pain like so bad. But after one, the pain from my hand gone, it started back again. Well, I did one incident report where she came to school and she had all was all red on her um, knuckles, and she said that she'd been in the playground, which is an area of camp, at midnight, on her own, and that she'd punched a, a metal wall, metal bar, sorry, pole. And first I was saying, well, what were you doing in the play... You shouldn't be in the playground on your own, you know, in the middle of the night. And she said, I'd do it every night. i go there and cry. In October 2015, the school was closed. Its air-conditioned classrooms were taken over by Border Force. A small group of different teachers went to the Nauruan schools with the children. Christy Mannell was one of them. I've travelled a lot and I've worked in a lot of schools across Asia and Africa and I still will never get over what I saw at Nauru College. The stench of urine hits you as you walk in and the toilet, the girl's toilet, is like nothing I've ever seen in my life. One day the girls said that they just simply couldn't use it. Uh, and they um, and I walked in and, and feces were were smeared all over the all over the walls. It wasn't only the toilets. Many Nauruans simply didn't want the detention centre children at their schools. The local kids they tell us that why did you come here? This is our country. We do not belong here. We hate you. We hate you guys. One day, me and my friends, our group was sitting at the lunch area and having lunch, having our lunch, and and a boy and a boy come and touch us badly and went away. And my one of my other friend told them that stop doing that, and they say that we will we will kill you guys, and they show the knife to us, and they say that. Don't, don't come here anymore. This is not your school. This is our school. This is our country. Go from here. Was there fighting? Uh, I witnessed fighting um, when I went to one of the schools to um, speak to the students and the teacher. Uh, I witnessed fighting in the yard. I mean, quite, quite violent fighting, students hitting the ground and rolling around um, and teachers walking past with no intervention in that. In fact, I was about to intervene and I was told by another teacher not to. <laughs> These pictures were filmed a few months ago outside Nauru College. <laughs> the white shirts are school uniforms. They fight very badly and sometimes even blood come out. And I was so scared that they fight like this. They were, they were both Nauruans and they were fighting, they were punching each other and even the blood came out. So we were so scared. Yeah, physical fights are constant. Yes, definitely. Often between uh, boys, Nauruan kids, um, it's, it's quite a violent culture. <laughs> I even saw an attempted murder when I was on Nauru with a, um, with a machete. So um, much violence. Violence reigns among the adults and as such the children pick up on that and that's a way that they solve their problems. So what sort of things happen in the school? Uh, so children would solve their problems through fights on a regular basis. I really wanted to learn, I, I really wanted to be an educated person, so I always try my best to go to school. But 
I did try in here too. I did try my really, really best to go to school, but I don't feel safe in there. When a boy trapped her in the toilets and the teacher did nothing, Shamim stopped going to school. Yeah, I wasn't feeling good and the teachers were like so bad with me. They were just discriminating and the kid, the student, the other students too. And we, we didn't study nicely, like they didn't have teachers or anyone. So it was bad and that accident, what happened in the toilets and everything, it makes me so bad. And after, like, I'm getting more sick and sick and I'm vomiting every day and it's so hard for me to go there and study. Ten-year-old Batol has stopped going to school. She left this phone message for her former teachers. The reason I'm not going to school because I don't feel safe there. I am scared. Children are scaring us with their knife. When I grow up, I want to be a vet. How can I be a vet when I'm not going to school? So what we can do? I want to go to school. No one cares. My father cares. Amnesty International's Anya Neistat interviewed refugee children and their families in Nauru in July. No matter how horrible the detention was and the conditions in detention were, quite a few families and children themselves told me that now that they're in the community, they feel less safe because they're subjected to attacks from the local population. And of course, uh, they cannot, they simply cannot go to school because there as well, they are subjected to attacks. Uh, and there is absolutely nothing being done about this by the authorities. Navid and Hossein are Iranian. They and their families were among the first to be recognised as refugees and released from detention. Both of them have now spent more than 1,100 days in Nauru. You know, uh, like everyone else in my age, uh, we've got a dream. And my dream is to study medicine and end up uh, being... Uh, a surgeon, you know, you know, but unfortunately, I can't do it here. Even I, I'm, I'm trying the most by uh, getting to my pathway, but unfortunately, uh, that's not possible. The studies here are not possible. My goal is to be to become uh, to become a psychologist in future. Uh, and make my mom proud. We went to school. Uh, we've tried. We did the university studies. They're all useless. You know, like uh, even the even the certificate that they gave us, it's it's not uh, a real certificate or it's nothing. <laughs> Most of the time, Navid and Hossein just stay home. Even as young men, they're afraid to go outside after 10 at night. People in my age, not only me, like everyone here, are uh, really scared to uh, get out of their accommodation at uh, late nights because they're scared if someone would attack them or uh, threaten them or or like, um, how can I say it, uh, or rape them. Like many girls uh, won't go outside in evenings either, like alone. Like we should take our family, like the female part of our family outside for shopping, even, f even shopping, you know, there's, you know, you don't know what will happen. People throw stones, there's wild dogs if you're a small, um, person like Shamim is, for example, there are, there are large packs of wild dogs that just roam the island. And it's not a safe space to be, to be operating in on a daily basis, physically or emotionally. You see scary things and um, you're just, you're not safe.
Between Nauruans, public fighting is par for the course. Now that refugees have moved into the community, they've become targets for violence. We are not talking about minor incidents. We're talking about attacks with machetes, people being hit with metal bars, people being thrown off their motorcycles, thrown off the cliffs, people sustaining very serious injuries as a result. But what's even worse is that there is absolutely no response. All of these attacks are being perpetrated with complete impunity. Amid the everyday violence, refugee victims aren't a priority for the police. They're out for their own purposes. There's no incentive for the police to, to help, the, help the asylum seeker population at all. Navid and Hussein and their families have been hospitalised from punches, pushed off rocks and robbed. They've complained to the police, but the police haven't laid charges. I think it's safe to say in virtually none of the cases there has been any action when a refugee or an asylum seeker was attacked or assaulted uh, and uh, a Nauruan was brought to justice for that. On the 26th of April, Omid Masumali, a 24-year-old Iranian who'd been recognised as a refugee and was a friend of Navid and Hossein's, set himself on fire. Hossein was nearby. You know, unfortunately, uh, at the time when Omid self-immolated himself, uh, I was present there. And not only me, there were small kids present at, at the moment. And, you know, like, compared to the kids, I'm, I'm, you know, I can really control myself in many things, but they can't. They were present when Omid self emulated himself. And after that incident, many kids, they were affected mentally that they were crying at the nights, like they were seeing nightmares. You know, they were talking about the incidents between, among the children. You know, it's not a really good thing to, to experience when you're a child. Hossein blames himself for not being able to stop it happening. You know, uh, by, by seeing someone self emulating himself in front of you, it's not a little thing, I can say that. Or self-harming, or trying to uh, do horrible stuff in their body, you know? It's not an easy thing to cope with it, you know? Some people say, though, that he did it to try and come to Australia. What, what do you say to that? <laughs> he did it because he was tired from here. You know, What's the point to, of coming to Australia with a burned body? Yeah, exactly. What's the point of this? Like, why if, should yeah. why why should he do that to is go it, to Australia? Like, like, is it worth it? Like, to do that to come to Australia? No, I don't think so. Now, real hospital wasn't equipped to treat Omid's burns. It took 26 hours for Omid to be medevac to Australia, where he died. You know, when people came here, they were patient. I can't say that. Uh, like, I was patient. My family was patient. But right now, uh, even we got trouble at home. You know, the patience that we've got, it's demolished. And not only my family, everyone is like that. No one is patient anymore. They're just, uh, they're just waiting for a sparkle to explode, you know? I can describe it like that. Not to do big, I mean, not to do big things, like inside their family. Like, you know, situations in the, in, in the families are really bad. And, and it's something that Unfortunately, I, I can't explain it. And you it's have getting, to see it. It's getting worse and worse. Like, 
it's getting worse every day. Like, uh, they can't. I, I see that people can't take this anymore. Really. I try my best to be strong. I try. I try. My mom tries to make us happy. We we always keep ourselves busy. We try our best to keep ourselves busy, and we don't go out much because we don't want another something to happen to us, and we feel very sad about it. We don't want that. That's why we stays in the home. At 13, Ms. Bar has spent nearly a quarter of her life in Nauru. She's now a recognised refugee, but she's too afraid to go to school, fears she'll never see her father again, and she and her sisters mostly stay home for their safety. We ran away from Burma because of the, the raping things in Burma that's happening to the girls and burning houses and stealing. And we came here, we came to Australia, we tried to get to Australia, but now we are here, the same thing happening. Raping, stealing, killing. I, I've seen people, now people died. They, some people burned themselves. Some people take too much medicine and died. And some people say that they get harm from, they get the, Norwegian try to harm them, to hurt them, and and many other things like stealing, rope, stealing, raping. I have heard many things like that. Ms. Bar wants to go home, but her mother says they can't. I I really want to go back because I think I think that. In here, having stress, better we go back to home. I asked my mom that let's go back, but she said, no, it's not possible. If we go back, we will get killed. And I was like, why, mom? Even we are dying in here every day. So why not just, we just not die one day. Let's just go back. So she was like, no, we can't go back like that. You want to make up the end of the story? Yeah. When Gabby Sutherland first got back to Australia and got sad messages from Bartol, she wasn't sure what to do. She decided to give Bartol a cyber school. They are best friends forever and ever. Best friends forever and ever. That's a lovely story. We'd book in at a certain time, so I'd say, meet, meet me online, and she would message me 10 minutes before, I've got my books and I've got my pencil and I'm ready to go. They're still doing it. Wait for a long, long time? She was like really like sad, but she was sitting down, like watching the um, waves go up and down, up and down, up and down. In her three years in Nauru, Shamim has been recognised as a refugee, but she finds it hard to still have any hope for the future. They didn't accept us, but why now? Why, why now? They just, whenever we are happy, they just make it sad and bad and everything. Why, you shouldn't be happy. You can't illegally be sad and be like that. This is so hard for us. Already it's been so long. When I met Shereem, she was highly charismatic, kind-hearted ambitious and intelligent young woman. She was very, very popular and beloved. Um, everybody liked her. She, witty, caring, and she, I mean, she knows five languages, right? She's such a um, brilliant young person with so much potential and much ambition. She, at the time, she spoke about wanting to be a doctor. Um, yeah, she was a great kid. But by the middle of last year, Shamim was at the top of the list of the detention centre's most vulnerable children. I don't know. I'm sick emotionally, physically, everything. Mentally, not, it's not even only me, everyone. You can come and see in here. Every single person is sick, even though not physically, but they are just break by emotionally. Everyone is break.
Last October, when the Australian school closed and the teachers left, they were worried, especially about Shamim. Shamim said on many occasions and with increasing frequency over the past six months, you know, I have no hope, I don't want to be here, um, I can't go on. In the case of Shamim, she just wants somebody to give her a proper diagnosis, help me, and she, she cuts herself because she's so frustrated. Since February, Gabby Sutherland has been asking the Department of Immigration to urgently medivac Shamim to Australia for medical attention, but nothing has happened. Two weeks ago, Shamim left this message for her former teachers. I'm not feeling OK. That's why I haven't been replied to you guys. I'm so sorry for it. I'm not well, so I'm really sorry that I've seen your messages, but I haven't been replied to any of them. I worry about all of them, where, where they're going to you know, when's this going to end? And if it takes much longer, that, you know, certain people won't be able to keep holding on. Early next year, Shamim will turn 18. After three birthdays in Nauru, she says she just wants that next one to be a happy day. Don't care what country it is, but I just want to study good and have a good time and healthy and safety and happy. Not too much happy, not every happiness from the world, just a small, from, just a small piece from those every happiness. We just want to make like good friends and have a good times like you, like everyone in other country who is safe, have in their home sweet home and staying there and studying and playing, everything. I just want to be the same person like everyone. If the material covered in this story has raised any issues of concern for you, you can contact one of these services.